Welcome to Fighting Disinformation to Save Democracy, a lecture sponsored by the Communication Institute at the University of Utah and the Department of Communication. Permanently established in 1997 by the Board of Trustees, the Communication Institute is a channel through which communication scholarship, teaching, and service is made available to the campus community, the broader community of Salt Lake City, and beyond. The Institute supports the dissemination of research and pedagogy in all forms of communication practice. You can follow announcements of our upcoming events on Twitter and find recordings of this and other events uh, that will be posted to our YouTube channel. Links for both of those are pasted in the chat window. Our speaker today is Ms. Clor uh, Claudia Flores Saviaga. She's a PhD candidate in the Citizen AI Lab at Northeastern University and a member of the Influence Operations Research Group at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Her research focuses on the areas of artificial intelligence, crowdsourcing, and social computing. She's interested in understanding how bad actors organize disinformation and propaganda messages, and how other citizens organize to debunk those manipulative messages. She uses this knowledge to then design intelligent systems that can fight disinformation at scale. Her research has been covered by the Associated Press, Newsweek, and BuzzFeed, as well as on national television. Her research has caught the attention and has initiated collaborations with think tanks and organizations such as the Wikimedia Foundation, the Atlantic Council, the National Democratic Institute, and the Organization of American States. Previously, she worked as a technical advisor to the governor of the state of Veracruz in Mexico and has provided technical advice to the presidency of Mexico. She is currently collaborating with Mexico's Ministry of Foreign Affairs to fight political disinformation targeting Latinx immigrants she has a master's degree in information technology from Carnegie Mellon University. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to her now. If you have questions, please put those in the Q&A panel here in Zoom, and she will answer those at the end of her talk. And I'm going to also paste some additional uh, reference information, including her website and some other information about her research, uh, into the chat window if you want to check that out. Uh, at some point. But with that, I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to you now, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you for, ha for the invitation. I'm very excited about being here. Um, I, I'm very excited because right now we are like living difficult times and this information is going to be something that is going to be more and more frequent on social media during these days. So part of the, why, the reason why wanted to make it like being the stock is just to make you make people aware about the problem but also make people aware about why this is a difficult problem and it's not something that can be solved easily um, so i'm gonna start with the talk and this talk i'm gonna be focused a lot on talking especially about social media platforms because as we know, these social media platforms have become very, very important in our lives. Um, they're important because they can be used for citizens, for uh, empower them and engagement during different events, such as protests. Uh, one of the first relevant examples of this is the Arab Spring. For those who don't know, uh, the Arab Spring was a series of pro-democracy protests that occurred during the spring of 2011 in different countries, such as Tunisia, Morocco, Syria, Libya, Egypt, among others. And they were relevant because during this protest, social media was used uh, mainly by the citizens to coordinate these protests on the ground and also to keep the Western countries informed about what was happening throughout the region. Now, if you come up to the recent times, another very uh, relevant example was the Black Lives Matter movement. And in this movement, participants also use social media to uh, locate each other and to like be together, establish uh, an, an identity, and also to coordinate their activities on the ground. Now, social media also is very relevant during crisis events and natural disasters because they allow people to coordinate rescue efforts so they can help each other, also to, to know where the, where the help is needed so they can coordinate different things such as donations, for example. Now, the problem is that the same, the same affordances that social media has for the social good 
it also can be exploited for malicious purposes. So for example, to spread disinformation and propaganda. Now, if you are not very familiar with the topic, this is this all this this information is part of what uh, like scholars call types of information disorder, and this information is only one type, uh, and their main characteristic is that it's intended to deceive. So, for example, those social media posts that are fabricated or deliberately manipulated uh, using different images or content that is created just to deceive people. In contrast, we have another type of information disorder that is misinformation. So misinformation, it's something that, not, that might not be true, but it was not intended to deceive. And this something uh, ha usually happens when citizens are sharing something, some information that they are not uh, completely, true, completely sure that it is true, but it, they share it anyways. And this creates, the, this confuses people because sometimes people when they are during crisis are trying to make sense of what's going on and they trust anything that is, they, see, they see on social media. So this is like the, the, the different types that were like defined by the Council of Europe about this information disorder. And if you see something or you might notice that is a term that is very popular use that is not in here. And I don't know if, if you have heard it, but probably you have because very common that is the term fake news. And why fake news is not in here? And part of the reason is because scholars argue that this term is very bad. So it doesn't like properly define the complex of this type of information disorders. Another important reason is because sometimes politicians have been using the term fake news, especially to describe the news media organization whose coverage they find disagreeable. So uh, that's, that's why scholars and researchers do not like to use the, that term that much, although it's also being used currently. Um, now, when we look at research about different governments and political trolls or political actors that have used uh, different techniques to manipulate social media to influence public opinion, we found, uh, research has found that this is like happening worldwide. Specifically, there's a research that, talk, that has quantified this and has found this problem in around 81 countries. Uh, so different governments use this to try to influence uh, public opinion, and they use they use it uh, using a combination of automated and semi-automated accounts. So the automated accounts are those that are popularly called bots that that are like these algorithms that are used just to pro propagate the, the disinformation like at a scale. The semi-automated accounts are harder uh, to detect because they're not only using this automation like to spread the disinformation, but also they have like a person behind them. So they combine that, uh, that activity to be automated and to be used by a human to spread this information. And this makes it difficult for like machine learning models or artificial intelligence to detect them because they seem like a normal person. And that's why it's, they're very like dangerous. Like, like um, one uh, author said, I repeat a lie after enough and it becomes the truth. That's what happens with this information, and what, that's why it's very dangerous. Because if you see some some something that might be false, uh, and you like just see it repeatedly, you might end up believing in it. So, uh, what are the current solutions that exist to try to mitigate this problem? Well, there are different uh, types of them. The more popular ones are the fact checking initiatives. And the other ones that are very popular are the systems that are already created to automatize the news image and video verification. So for example, in terms of fact-checking initiatives, uh, there's a census that it's been done by the Duke's Reported Lab that has identified 353 active fact-checking projects up until today. Uh, you can go into the website, it's very like interactive. So you can see which ones are within your, your region and who is behind them. Um, now, what is the problem with fact-checking initiatives? 
The problem with fact checking initiatives is that most of the times they are run by uh, like volunteers or NGOs, and it is very hard for them to scale, like to do this verification at scale. And this is even more problematic during events that are, are like breaking news events, such as crisis or natural disasters. And this is mainly because it is extremely hard to keep up with the amount of information that is posted every day on social media. So I don't know if you know this graph, but this is a very popular graph that's, that is called data never sleeps. And it's the amount of information that is shared per minute of the day. And for example, if you see Twitter, it says that around half a million tweets are posted on Twitter per minute. So that's the, the amount of the, that, that's the problem with, uh, with the amount of information that is circulating. Now, there are other systems that are available that people can use um, that, to do the image news and video verification. Three of the popular ones are T9, that is for image verification, Opsi, that is used to visualize the spread of information on Twitter, or even Google uh, just released their fact check tools that in which you can search fact check results from the web around a topic. Now, the problem is that we still have this information. Society is still plagued with this information. And this is problematic for democracy and for citizen participation because sometimes that people might be not willing to participate in the public conversations just because they don't know who to believe. Like, what are you going to believe? So um, another problem is that these solutions are just seeing one part of the story. They are seeing the result of the disinformation, I mean, the posts that are being posted on social media, but they are not understanding how people engage with this information, with the news, and how they are like organizing to create that. So I argue that in order to design effective solutions to counter disinformation, we need to understand first two things. The first, two thing, the first thing that we need to understand is how people engage in collective action to create this information and how people engage in collective action to counter this information. Now, to, to talk about this, I'm gonna touch in different case studies and different analysis so you can have a very understood understanding of what I'm talking about. Uh, first, I will present uh, one case study that is about how people produce this information. Then I'm going to talk about how people have organized themselves to counter this information. I'm going to briefly present a system uh, using these design principles that, that I found in those two case studies. And then I'm going to talk a little bit of analysis that I've been doing with certain NGOs to understand the problem at larger scale. Um, the first study is the one that is related to how people produce this information. And this is a study was done to understand how a political trolley commu community already organized for this purpose. So um, the majority of research about, the, about understanding these political actors or political trolls that were on social media or that are on social media producing disinformation have only seen uh, were were only seeing one part of the story. For example, they were seeing only how to detect them or how to moderate them or which types of stroll system that existed on at the time, or detecting their harassment or or the hate speech trends. But they were not seeing how they were organizing others to do this like mobilization at scale. So that's why we need, I argue that we need first to understand how they're organizing if we want to know, to learn how to create systems to fight this information that they are spreading. So as I said, this is a, a, a case study of how this community of political trolls was able to attract, engage, organize its members for collective actions to produce this, this information. And um, this community, I don't know if you knew about it, but it's called, it was called the Donald. And this community originated around the um, time that the ex-president announced his presidential run in June of 2015. 
and it was labeled as one of the most active and largest political troll communities. Um, this subreddit is one in which participants share news about political events and they receive a lot of press coverage just because how they were coordinated uh, to disrupt and harass political opponents and also um, how they flood the internet with propaganda. Now, after, after some times, the, the subreddit was um, quarantined and placed into a restricted mode in early 2020 after repeated misbehaviors that included hate speech and disinformation. And right now they move uh, to a dedicated server so they can continue with the work. Um, now, this case study is very interested because until before, before that, the internet was already being used for political campaigns. Obama used it a lot for organizing like people on the ground, organizing donations. But this was the first time that a political troll community just organized online other members to, to, to accomplish certain purpose. And their purpose was just to spread the word about their candidate, to make the, to spread the propaganda and also to spread this information and attack opponents. So that's why it's very relevant. It's not so much about which political side he was like pursuing. It was more about how they were coordinating and why they were achieving what they, they were achieving. So that's why my research questions in, in this case study was mainly to know what techniques these political trolls were using to call people into action to help produce this information, and which of those techniques were the more, more effective ones to mobilize people to participate in this. So this analysis was done collecting around 16 million posts of co of, and comments uh, that, that they were on the subreddit from around 300,000 participants. Um, and what I did, I won't get too much in the details because they're very technical, but basically what I was trying to find is just those posts in which people were calling to action. Let's say a call to action is when someone was saying, hey, let's, I have a meme that I just created, let's share it on Twitter, please pass it on to your, like, to other people to other accounts so you can reshare it on other social platform or let's go on Facebook and, and find this person and just let's like let's like target it and spread like like I don't know insulting them or whatever. So there was like certain things that they were doing that it meant that they were doing call to actions. So to do that the, the simplest way that to do that is just to create a list of these action verbs that could signify that they were calling to action others. And there's just to um, class, just to grab all those comments that contain those action verbs, like have other people just to classify, to verify that they actually were calling to action. So I, I was sure that I was on, I only analyzed the information that I wanted to analyze. And then just use machine learning models that could help me just to character trying to find patterns with that information. So what we call them clusters. So cluster them according to their characteristics. And what I found is that um, there were three main styles that they were using to, for these call to actions and that, that I discovered. The main one was like what I call the troll slang cluster. And that I'm gonna explain them uh, uh, in detail. The second one was the viral news, and the third one was the historical style, story and style. So the first one that is the slang cluster, and this type of call to actions involve making calls to actions that use mainly their slang or their own terminology. And um, we believe that this slang was something that helped them to create data identity because only they understand each other using the slang. I mean, they felt like a community. They use like certain terms like deplorables or they have like certain figures like Pepe, Pepe the Frost. Um, and the creation of such collective identity might facilitate uh, driving people into action. So for example, they organize themselves to do this call to actions, calling each other's like using this slang. Now, the other strategy was the viral strategy. 
And this one's something uh, that they use frequently when they're trying to make something happen very fast. Um, so they, they was, the, these call to actions were very short and direct. Um, and one example was, for example, where they're trying to like mess around with the Reddit uh, algorithm to make something appear, appear on the first page of Reddit. So something appears on the first page of Reddit if it's very outvoted constantly and in a short period of time. And they did this like on and on, like all the time until Reddit had to intervene and change the, its algorithm to try to stop them from happening because they were being very successful. So the other uh, style was the story and strategy style. And the story strategy style, like this style, it was characterized because they provided a lot of historical context about what was going on, why they should, should support the political candidate. For example, they create different manuals and this created these conspiracy theories in, in the way that they tweak the information until resemble something possible. Um, and this false reality that was ready for consumption by the general public. So basically they were trying like uh, to say people or convince people about what it was important for them to participate and what was their side of the story. Um, now, when, when I tr was trying to analyze or when I analyzed what were the most effective techniques to mobilize people uh, to participate, I found that actually the one was the most effective was uh, the historian style. Um, this graph showcases the different styles. Um, it is color coded. Each dot represents a post that was making a call to action. The X axis shows the number of comments that each call to action received. The y-axis is the number of votes that it received. And as you can see, the historian styles that it is in blue obtained the most constant number of comments and of votes. So this means that they were engaging the community the most using this type of call to action. Um, I think that is because that people, people seem to participate the most when they could understand what was going on. And that's why this style seemed to be getting more engagement. So another thing that I found really fascinating that was they were using certain not so obvious techniques uh, to keep me people motivated to participate and do not go to do not go away. So one part of the reason why um, this is very significant it was on up till then um, this was the first community that used bots as a form of a game to keep creating their identity and engage, keep people engaged. Because this bot, what it was is that, how it worked is that every time that people use a slang word, a certain term, this, uh, they promoted like the train, this imaginary train, uh, it's gonna increase the speed. So they were trying to compete who like took the train further, this imaginary train. So they kept like people engaged and it was like very, very heavily used. Um, another thing that was very relevant is that this community was very effective in making things easier for people to participate. Part of the reason why people do not participate is because maybe people do not have uh, did not have like enough time to do it so what they did it was that they ahead of time created like a repository of memes that they uploaded uh, to their like to I don't know google drive or any repository and they, they just told people, hey, this is the list of hashtags that you need, hashtags that you need to use. You can get any meme from this repository, just post it on your Twitter account and spread it for their two other um, accounts that you might have. Now, the takeaways from this is that we can use this information for social good. We can use uh, this information to create systems that can help like spread like good information. And so the takeaways is that microtasks uh, facilitate participation in this information production and spreading, but we can use it to also help people to uh, spread like good information. 
And also one of the most effective techniques that political trolls had for driving participation was these conspiracy theories or using this historian style. So this means that people that if we want people to participate in certain cause online, we need to explain them and make sure that they understand why they are doing it. Now, this has, as, as I said, this has these design implications. These design implications mean that once we know this, you can we can use them to create systems that might have like a better purpose, like to spread good information to make it go viral. That is using micro tasks, using these bots to keep, keep people organized and um, create a sense of identity and also explain taking time to explain uh, what is going on and what we want to achieve what, when we are doing the systems. Um, this is also relevant because it is important to know why this disinformation was being very successful. And this is another um, white paper that I used, uh, uh, that I did with the Institute for the Future, that is an NGO dedicated to understand this type of um, problems. And it was mainly to understand what was going on around the Latin community. So for example, uh, during the midterms, uh, prior to the midterms election of 2018, uh, people started to get concerned about if they, how political trolls might be engaging with the Latin community. Uh, we did like a decent analysis about what was going on on the platform. And what we discovered is that um, actually the, the this information was like permeating in, in the different subreddits. And what, what was more striking is that part of the reason was because these people were not having enough reliable information. And this is called a data void. So for example, um, a data void then occurs when information about certain topic is that is uh, on social media is limited or not existent. And when topics are not covered by rigor, by authoritative and credible sources, then these political trolls can push their own agenda and push their own information in these voids. And then people just have that and do, could, will only believe that because they don't have anything more reliable. And that's why it is important to detect and to address this problem. Um, the second case study is gonna see like the other part about how people can organize themselves and engage in collective actions to counter this information. And this is part of the study that I use um, analyzing the information that happened in the aftermath of an earthquake. Um, as I said before, uh, sharing information during natural disasters uh, makes uh, social media especially vulnerable to the spread of false information. However, uh, it was not clear how people were organizing during these events to verify information. And we have we, we start to see on the media that it, it was already happening. So we needed to understand that and how the, the, the citizen had play, played a very important role in verifying information during those crisis events, especially because I said before, during those crisis events, information floods on social media. And it's very hard to keep up, to keep up uh, to verify that. So uh, in this case, what I did is to understand how members of the citizen-led movement that emerged in the aftermath of a large-scale earthquake in Mexico managed to coordinate themselves to verify the accuracy information that was circulated on the news. And this initiative um, is called Verificado 19S or Verify 19S that it was an initiative that is, was composed of uh, news media outlets, uh, NGOs, uh, universities, citizens all around the city to, uh, that was created just to provide verified information. And this is, was the, for context, the earthquake happened on September 19 of 2007 and affecting the main areas of Mexico City, that it's a 20 million people city. So this research question is how do people organize across social media platforms to counter this information? For this was uh, that I analyzed one month um, of data related to the earthquake after the earthquake happened 
from different social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, and Slack, and GitHub. For those who don't know, GitHub is a repository for code where uh, people from computer science uh, background can organize uh, their code online. And also surveyed around 300 people um, on, online that participated in the rescue efforts and the, and the verification on information. So I did uh, two types of analysis. I did the qualitative analysis of, of the surveys to understand uh, what people were expressing about how they did this, they did this verification and also a quantitative analysis that I'm going to show uh, a little bit later, the network structure of how the organized or the information was or being was circulating across social media platforms. Uh, I'm going to explain a little bit more later. So uh, one of the most like extraordinary things that I found is that they have like a really structured mechanisms that was that was like organized so people could like verify information on the ground and do not spread mis or disinformation. So they would stop it before it happened. So it was like more a preventive thing. Um, so what it, what, what it, what it, how it functioned is that people was a recurrent volunteers on social media, mainly from this NGO that is called Verificado 19S. 19S. Um, they recruit people on, online just to, so as volunteers to participate in the initiative and then say that the micro task to people to verify the information on the ground. So once the people verify the information on the ground, they send back the information to this NGO and the NGO was the only one who was authorized to spread the verified information across uh, different social media platforms. Um, now, another thing that was very uh, not noteworthy is that, as I said before, um, to solve the problem of the type of misinformation, disinformation that circulates around um, this type of events, is that they, they created like a mechanism or a template to keep information relevant. And that's, this was very, very useful during the rescue efforts. So on the Slack platform, people collaborate and brainstorm ideas to ultimate, that ultimately led to the development of like this template that verified use in across all their posts where they were like uh, requesting certain like things that people might need. And they included different things. They included like the, what, what they need, uh, where it was needed, what it was needed and what the request was created. Now, part of the problem with, with, with misinformation, disinformation that circulates on social media, it could be any type like Reddit, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, any social network, is that sometimes there are images that are circulated that people think that are like, like recent, but might be having like been created like in the past. There's no easy way that you can do this verification other than just going to online and try to see if it already happened. But this is like, this is time consuming. And if you are like trying to rescue people from an earthquake, you don't have time for that. So they try to like mitigate this risk of uh, sharing information that was outdated using this simple mechanism to, to do it. And this makes sure that the people that, that people receive the help when they need it and the, the help that or not more that they need it because otherwise that might be uh, prevent people from getting the help somewhere else. Now, regarding the quantitative analysis, uh, the thing that is most relevant for those who are not familiar, this is like a network, uh, network of how the information was circulated on different social platforms, like and for example, on Twitter, how this NGO was uh, was um, collaborating with our citizens, or for example, we have this presidency of Mexico also in there. So there are many different accounts. The thing that is more relevant for this case is that we found that there was like a clear separations between this NGO that is Verificado 19S and the government. And that is not worthy because you might think that when there is like these natural disasters, there would be like a natural relationships between NGOs and the government, but this wasn't the case. 
And when analyzed with why this wasn't the case, it was mainly because people didn't trust the government. Like they didn't trust that the help was gonna arrive when uh, to, to the shelters. They didn't trust that the nations would arrive to the right people. So that's why they prefer to work with NGOs. And this is something that also you need to take into account where you, for example, that is something very prevalent in Latin America, but might not apply to other countries where people trust the government more in these types, uh, in these types of um, events. Now, what are the main takeaways? The main takeaways is that these mechanisms that verificaron ITNs follow that it was citizen driven and it was collaborative. Uh, I, it was very successful to verify the misleading information and address information data voids, so data deficiencies that we discussed before. They also, as the previous example, they also dispatched this micro task to coordinate citizens. And they also collaborated, coordinated and brainstormed ideas using like a, these, these backstage mechanisms to coordinate and self distribute the information across social media. Um, now, when you are trying to design systems to counter this information, the design implications is this, it's important to have these collaborative mechanisms to verify the misleading information, uh, uh, such as like a backstage uh, a Slack, I mean, it also it's a good idea. Now, I'm not going to get too much involved in systems because I'm, I'm, I'm more from computer science and I want to, to talk a little bit more about this information and analysis, but I'm going to present one that is very relevant and that I like a lot. Uh, as I told you, when there are data voids uh, are in different social media platforms, this information can emerge. Let's, for example, think about Wikipedia. If Wikipedia is the this knowledge encyclopedia that is has knowledge from all over the world in many many different languages, and not all the languages are covered. And this is something that we uh, detected that was happening in Wikipedia in Spanish. So what we did is that we collaborated with Wikipedia to try to um, address this data voice that Wikipedia was happening. Well, that was happening in Wikipedia. I'm sorry. Um, so to narrow down the problem, we focus only on addressing these data voids that were uh, in in the that were happening in the biographies of women in Wikipedia. So we detected that there were many women that have that were have been relevant uh, around the history, uh, just they didn't have a Wikipedia article about them in Spanish. So what we did is that we use some of the science, the science principles that I said before to try to coordinate people to create uh, these biographies on, on the Wikipedia. So we recruit people using social media bots um, that what we did was mainly try to detect people that uh, might be interested on gender issues, so for example, they were talking about gender issues on Twitter or they were like supporting gender causes. So mainly we were trying to like recruit this community of women that were interested in, that might be interested in participating. We also, what we did was create this template of micro tasks that they could help us with. So that way we wouldn't take like much time uh, from them to collaborate. So for example, there were simple questions about, the first one was, which women do you think that should have a bio on Wikipedia that, and then gave us like ideas. Another thing would be, would be like simple, like, like things that that woman did, like where are their achievements, where she was born, et cetera, et cetera. So were very short questions. There's questions that feed on a tweet. And then we use like crowd workers that are mainly like people that was just um, hired to put together this article and publish on, on Wikipedia. What we did is just create like this small paragraph to put in Wikipedia. And this way we, we did like this experiment over two week period and we were able to cover two these two write two 12 articles using this method. So this is a way of proving how if you understand uh, what you could do uh, to find this information, it's easier to design systems to, to do this. Now, 
This is part of the research that I've done on my PhD, but also I've been collaborated with different civic organizations uh, to understand this information on the ground and also information operations that are happening across social media to then design systems to safeguards on democracy, uh, or democracies. And that's part of my, the second part of my talk. I'm doing, is there gonna be like very uh, brief analysis about different types of information that, uh, studies that we have done with these civic organizations? But I think there are very good examples uh, so you can understand why this is a problem that is very hard to solve and why sometimes it's not that obvious that you are having this information or this information or you are seeing this information or this information. So the first one is gonna be a study of Russian disinformation or propaganda, if you wanna call it that. And also the second one is a study of Chinese disinformation. Now, the, fir the first one is about Russia. And this is something that we did uh, to try to understand what was going on in Latin America. Unfortunately, in Latin America, there are not many researchers that are doing this work. So our knowledge and understanding about the problem is very limited. Uh, the, um, uh, what we did was that on the 2008, we collected around uh, one year data or 200 tweets, like this sample from RT in Spanish, that is called Actualidad RT. And RT, for those who don't know, is a Russian state-controlled international television network that was funded by the government uh, for their strategic communication purposes. So what is special about this is that they use a mixture of viral content that they distribute on social media, but also they combine it with the propaganda and disinformation. And their main narrative is to, to uh, the criticisms of the United States and the Western democracies. So, uh, the dis Russian disinformation, one thing is that it, that it has is that very predictable. It's not that hard to see once you know how it works. Um, the strategies that they mainly use can some, be summed up in four words. Uh, the first one is dismiss, distort, distract, and dismay. So the first strategy that dismiss is uh, consists of just dismissing the negative comments or reports uh, that are emerging on social media about them, either by denying the allegations or denigrating the one who makes them. And for example, in the case of Mexico City, um, there, I mean, RT in, in Spanish, there was this, um, this information or this post that was circulating in, uh, about the Russia intervention at the time in which the US was accusing Russia of intervening in Latin America. And what they did it was they were spreading this video in which, according to the narrator, the US uh, has no right to affirm that he has done the same. Uh, has, uh, to, they have no right to affirm this because they have done the same in other countries. And they posted like all the examples about how they have been intervened in different countries around the world. So the second um, strategy, it was distort. Um, and the purpose of this strategy is to distort information to serve their overall narrative. So for example, in this case, it was an example about how US, uh, US wanted to start a war in Latin America. So RT, uh, in this post, RT claims that the US is, is a dictator whose actions have, been, have hidden intentions and producing intended consequences. So mainly what is the, the post says that uh, RT is reporting that Mike Pence trip to Latin America in 2008 is an indication that the United States is planning a war in the region. Now, the third one is distract. And this mainly just consists of turning attention away from the activities of the Russia and its allies, and sometimes just to create doubt, to create confusion about whether the source that is sharing that information um, can be trust or not. And this is like very unique because this is something that might be innocent, but, and it's very easy for, easy for people to like believe in. So this is an example of the Mexican elections in 2008. What happened is that the Department of State, um, they were announcing that they had detected that there were initial signs that Russia was intervening in Mexico's presidential campaigns. 
And what started to happen as is that they started to create these themes about how it was very funny that even they like shared this the, the the wife of the presidential candidate back then shared this like meme about uh, with with the hat of the president using a Russian hat and sharing changing his name to um, his name was Amlo and he changed to uh, end like in a Russian sounding word like Amlovsky and it, it like was quietly spread. So people thought that it was very funny. And they say, and then RT said, hey, here come the Russians, the me media mythology of the alleged Russian intervention in Mexico. And they started this meme campaign that actually people was very amused of and became viral. And the final strategy is dismay. And the purpose of this strategy is to um, spread dismay either by warning uh, that much that that most which Russia poses will have those distrustful consequences for those planning them, and the purpose mainly is to intimidate opponents, embolden the position, and ideally force a change of course. And it is something that we have seen in the late days, that is the the use of nuclear we weapons. Now, this uh, post, for example, the RT was circulating in Spanish, had like this clear. Um, the, this clear like legend that said a nuclear war between Russia and the United States would be the end of civilization. And also they share another one that says uh, that was sharing a video about weapons that no one else has and put, putting a, a, talking about the weapons that they have. So it was uh, something to intimidate people and make people fear. I mean, I'm not saying that they won't use it ever, but it's something that they do constantly every time that there's a crisis. So that's a, um, something that you have to take into account when you are seeing like information on social media about what might and might not be true and what might be more propaganda, because the, uh, this type of narrative that they have can be viewed as an offensive weapon. I mean, it's, it's a, they want to discredit the, discredit the Western democracies and present Russia like this peaceful world that just like, we are like uh, the, the ones who are being attacked. Um, and that's why the, one of the main objectives or RT is to gather an audience uh, that believes in them in times of peace and that will that then, then will list them in times of war. So that's why they create like a lot of viral content that people might engage with. Now, if we now turn to other type of uh, disinformation is the one with China. And this one is very different. Their tactics are very different. And I think that it is also important that you understand. So this is something that uh, we did about the PCR, that is the, uh, the Public Republic of China, uh, like political party and how they were like working in Latin America. So for this, we collected around 400, uh, 40,000 tweets from 32 Twitter accounts uh from either people from the government of china or uh, relevant news media outlets that are, are in spanish that also belong to china and also influencers from china and all this was one in collaboration with the u.s embassy uh in mexico city because they were like very aware of which uh twitter accounts they we must analyze so we we collaborated with them for this um and this is the strategy that they have a little bit different these strategies that they have is what they call this peaceful rice narrative. That's the main one. And also a little bit about uh, silence the critics uh, to diminish the China is a threat narrative. Also the narrative about how China is like a, the support network to Latin America and very rarely, very, very rarely to try to divide allies of their, of their enemies. Now, the first one, the peaceful rice narrative, is just this narrative that consists of presenting uh, China as um, how it's a world leader, like uh, in different like like uh, areas. So, for example, in this case, they were like very, very, very interested in showing how China was combating the coronavirus and how they were building like these hospitals to like treat the populations in their country 
and that was like something that was circulating a lot. And this is uh, something that we can see that other social media accounts uh, within the region were like spreading the content along. Um, the other one is silence critics. Critics, as I said, um, the PCRs is very interested in sharing content and trying to like make people aware that the other ones are the bad guys. So for example, in this case, there was like a uh, Brazilian politicians um, that is the son of the current president of Brazil that was uh, blaming China for the pandemic. And the embassy of China in Brazil really replied and attacked him like about why it was not true. And then it, other accounts were starting sharing this one. Mm, the, the other one that is also very interesting is to create support network to, uh, uh, for Latin America, how the government of China is creating the support network to other countries. And this is something that I also share a lot and it's more about how they um, were like giving help to different countries, donated supply uh, masks or vaccines to different parts in Latin America, how everybody like we are one. Uh, this is something of the ambassador of China retweeted like how the Jack Ma Foundation was doing this in different parts of Latin America. And the final one is just to divide Western allies. And this is something that we didn't see that much, but it was like also happening. Um, so for example, the embassy of China in France created uh, this short film uh, criticizing the US and its response to COVID, uh, and also another consulate, a Chinese consulate in another country, I think it was Canada, also retreated this content. But this was something that it was not like very frequent to find. It, and it was mainly because China, what they want is to highlight how good they are, like how much technology they have, how they are supporting other countries, and like hide what is wrong with the regimen. That's like the main thing. And that way it would be like people more trustful about when they share something that might not be true. And also for this reason, they want to undermine the China is a threat narrative. So now that we know all of this, what can we do? Well, I think that there's still a lot of things that we don't know. Like, as I told you, there are certain things that we already know that are pretty common in propaganda and disinformation. But uh, as I told you before, this is happen happening in 81 country that at least that was, that is what, what is documented up till now. So there's still a lot of things that we need to understand. For example, studies uh, that are about the financial networks and how their governments are like trying, like are paying for this for this type of influence operations that are conducted. Um, we also need to understand this if we want to create the like, different design principles for the next generation of systems that can empower citizens to fight different information collaboratively. And I emphasize that empower citizens because as I told you, this is a very complex problem and we cannot leave that problem only to social media platforms because as much as advanced as artificial intelligence and machine learning is to detect this there are still things that they cannot do they need like our human input for example it's very difficult to understand sarcasm it's very difficult to understand slang it's very difficult to get to understand the political or regional context. It's very difficult to train these systems in every possible language around the world. And things are changed they change day to day. So that's why we need like a human in the loop approach. The, meaning we have like technology, but also we have from the other side citizens helping to, to fight this. We also need to um, create these introductory courses of influence operations, not only for citizens, for NGOs, for journalists, for everybody who, who, who interact with these platforms, because that way it will be easier for them to understand what they're seeing and be a little bit more critical and have the tools that so they can like verify information by themselves. 
And finally, I think that we need to create strategies um, that can prevent, deconstruct, and disempower these narratives from foreign governments that might want to uh, influence public opinion for like a, for a for for the bad things. And I think that uh, that's a very important one. So I'm going to end up my presentation here, but I'm very open to questions and also for discussion about the problems that this information uh, that we might see in the coming days do. Well, thank you so much, Claudia, for, for joining us and for speaking today and telling us about your research. Um, one of the things that we're really trying to do with Communication Institute is put people in communication um, sort of in contact with folks from other disciplines that are working on communication related topics um, from a different kind of a perspective. And I think you definitely brought that to us today. Um, we don't, I think, have a lot of people, at least in our department, that are taking a computer science approach and who are using artificial intelligence um, uh, and, and that sort of thing in their work. And so um, I know this is a, a sort of a new and, and different perspective. And so I'm happy to, to have you as one of our first speakers of our renewed effort to um, have some Communication Institute um, lectures that we're going to be offering regularly. Um, I hope that um, maybe there's some connections that have been made uh, with some of the folks in the audience, some of the graduate students and some of the faculty that are here today. Um, and uh, maybe folks will continue to be in touch after this, uh, after this meeting. And maybe some collaborations will come out of this, especially with some of our uh, media studies and media effects folks that I know are on the meeting. So thank you so much for joining us and um, please continue to stay in touch with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I think that you are totally right. We need to collaborate among different like professions. Right now, for example, I know I, I'm from a computer science part, but I, I, I've been collaborating a lot of also with journalists to get their perspective about uh, how they verify information, how we can create system for them, for example, in the sense of uh, data voids. I mean, we have been uh, designing systems to help them navigate the social media ecosystems. So it, it's better for, it's, how, it's easier for them to detect where the voice are being created on social media, what information people are not getting and which perspective are getting, which not, and then can then jump in and create the articles on the information that people are needing. Because it's very hard uh, like for uh, doing manually to try to detect what information, what information people are requesting, for example, on social media, sometimes people might be in, might want to know about certain topics, but it's really, if you don't do this like a scale analysis, it's very hard for you to detect that other, other than just seeing like manually. So I think that this type of collaborations would be very fruitful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who came to the talk and, and uh, participated and asked some questions and made some comments. Um, that's what makes it all more lively and, and valuable for everyone. So thank you all. And please um, check out the YouTube channel, check out the, um, the Twitter um, for uh, information about upcoming events. So thank you all. Thank you.